Hi, welcome to the Law of Foho podcast. I am Robert Foho, and I have with me today Dr. Rick Cromey. Rick, thank you for your time. Thank you for joining me. Hey, absolute pleasure, Robert, to be with you and your uh, podcast audience out there by the millions is what I'm suspecting. Well, that's what we, uh, we're, we're hoping to get there at some point, uh, but <laughs> it's, it's a game of inches, as they say, uh, but I, I appreciate that. So uh, Dr. Cromey is, let me pull up my notes here so I can speak intelligently about you. <laughs> Dr. Cromey is a cultural historian. A uh, leadership professor and an inspirational speaker. He's been featured on <clears throat> um, Fox, NBC, PBS, Christian Living, and numerous other radio and online outlets. Uh, can you maybe speak a little bit more about what you do? I think you also have a nonprofit yeah. that you work with, a faith, faith-based nonprofit organization. Can you just give us a little bit more about your background and what you do and um, – and I'll just let you take it away. Yeah. Well, well again, thank you for the opportunity to be with you uh, today, uh, Robert. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm from Boise, Idaho. I live here in beautiful uh, uh, the Gem State, as we like to call it here. And it's uh, it's uh, I've been living here for about uh, oh 13, 14 years now. Uh, over a span, I've been kind of came back to Boise two or three times, but most recently in the last thirteen years. So it's since two thousand seven. Uh, but I'm. Um, I'm a cultural historian. I'm an author. I'm a speaker, motivational speaker, uh, inspirational speaker, as well as uh, edu. I like to call myself uh, an edu trainer because that's really what I do. Mm -hmm. I want to educate, but I want to do it in an inspirational way, an engaging way. It's a little bit different than the normal training that you get. And so I do a lot of that. And that's why I formed MANA Educational Services International uh, five years ago. It was uh, out of a call just to, to do things a little different than the average workshop and to train differently and to inspire differently. And so I have a, I have a daily email that goes out called the Morning MANA that's inspirational and, and insightful. And it's all original material. And, uh, you know, I've been doing this for about 40 years. So I've collected all sorts of things over the years. And, sure. you know, that's kind of how I got into this. It's just, it's been slow. I was, I was a professor for uh, 15 years and still am a professor, but actually in the classroom for 15 years and then felt a, a, a need just to kind of move out of that. And, and now um, I just, I, I play at my work and uh, I, I enjoy it. Manna, of course, is a, that's a biblical term, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah. And it, it's, a, it, it, it's a, so it's a faith-based uh, organization. How, how does faith play into what you do and, and who is it that you um, primarily focus on in terms of helping through the organization? Right. Well, by faith-based, I mean that primarily my, my organization works with churches and with uh, uh, organizations that have at least a, a statement of faith of some way. And, and most of them are tend to be from the Christian perspective uh, naturally, because that's, that's kind of my background right. and my, my area. I'm a former pastor as well. So that was, you know, faith-based, that tends to be where it's at. But, you know, in general, I do training across the board for any and every, all sorts of organizations and businesses and, and schools and, and such. And so I'm not limited just by the faith base, but uh, I do have this nonprofit organization because several years ago I was kind of starving at this work. And <laughs> I found that there were people that were willing to give to me in order to help me go and, and continue the work. And so that relieved a lot of the financial pressure. And so right. that's basically the, 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 the nonprofit helps me do what I do. But uh, on the other side, gen books like my Gentech book here that just came out, uh, it has more of a, a, of a, a broad appeal way beyond the faith based uh, realm. So I'm, I'm speaking in different uh, arenas now. Um, your book, which uh, you, you sent me a copy of that. And I, I thank you for that. I got through most of it and I, it's very interesting. Um, I think it's sort of uh a myth buster of sorts. It sort sort of disrupts the conventional thinking uh, concerning how we view generations of people. And um, and it, so, if, if 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 I can try to summarize the, the main idea or the thesis of of what you're trying to convey with the with the book, it's that we we shouldn't be defining generations in in, in these neat little boxes according yeah. to the ranges of years that, that people were born. And, and came of age in rather we should define 
generations in terms of the technology that mm-hmm. impacted and shaped those groups of people. Is that is that accurate? And if it's not, feel free to uh, <laughs> that to, is to exactly elaborate. <laughs> accurate. That's exactly right. Yeah, I you know it wasn't until you know I've been doing this generational analysis and and work uh, research really since the mid nineteen eighties. And back then it was the millennial generation that I was primarily looking at and under, we we're trying to understand them and this new crop of babies that were being born. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in 1995, the mid nineties, all of a sudden we had this new generation being born, which uh, was called Gen Z back then. It was like that, that kind of that, that blew me away because it only been about four or five years since we'd really named the millennials. Millennials didn't get their name until 1991 through a work by Strauss and Howe, Neil Howe and William mm-hmm. Strauss and their their book Generations. Uh, they named the millennial generation up to then. They were kind of played around with uh, even Gen X wasn't uh popular or common until uh, 1991 with a Douglas Copeland novel. The very same year, those two tags for generations came out and were attached uh, to two different generations. But Gen Z comes along four or five years later, and we're already naming a new generation. And they're not even they're they're still in their diapers, for Pete's sakes. We're we're naming this generation and we're being very lazy. I mean, the the alphabet naming game was just like, holy cow, is this where we're going to go? And then as I was researching this book, Gen Tech, uh, I was looking at what are we calling this new generation? Because I had to come up with a name for the new generation myself. And that was um, it was surprising to me. And yet not surprising that we were calling them Generation Alpha. So in other words, we're going back to the A in the alphabet now. And the <laughs> next generation will be alphabet or, or Generation Beta and then Gamma and then Delta. You know, we're naming them like the coronavirus here. And I just think that's very lazy. Uh, and really non-academic. And I think there's a better way to do it. And as you pointed out, my book argues that we are better framed and our personalities are better defined by the technology that we come of age to. And that's the key part in the mm. in this book is that we come of age. You know, there is technology that is tipping, that is popping, if you will, uh, while we're coming of age during our puberty years, ages mm. 10 to 25. So whatever technology is blossoming or tipping, you might say, is the one that frames us. So, for example, if you're born between 1940 and 1960, that that was television that was popping right. for you. Right. If you were born between 1980 and 1990, it was uh, cell phones and uh, uh, personal computers that were popping for you. Uh, if you were born in the 2000s, it was uh, the i technologies, the iPod, iPad, iStream, uh, you know, iTunes, mm-hmm. you know, iWatch, i iPhones, you know, those those i technologies. So they're not Gen Z at all. They are the i tech generation. That's what I call them. How, how did you get into the, the uh, studying generations? You said you started doing this back in the 80s. So how did you get into this? What what interested what interested you about it and, and why or how did you get into it? Well, back in the back in the 80s, when this was all what, somewhat new, I've always been a thinker. I've always been someone mm-hmm. who who enjoyed looking at uh, culture and and just studying how culture moves and changes and and social sociology and that. Uh, those have always been popular themes. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of fell into this one because I was doing um, uh, some, some thinking on it. And uh, I had an editor from a magazine I was writing for at the time asked me to write an article on the, the millennial generation. And so I did. And it was in that research and in that process that I came across Neil Howe and William Strauss. And, you know, this was still a little bit early in their game. They were still uh, – Uh, They hadn't yet produced the book Generations at this point, but I I became uh, rather fascinated by their idea that Mm. generations are more fluid and in their in their theory that they actually are uh, circular. They're like the seasons of the year. We have a spring, summer, fall and winter generation and then it repeats. So there's it's cyclical. Mm -hmm. We never looked at generations that way. Up to that point, generations were more like a more like a ruler. It was very linear. One generation after another generation after another generation. There was no rhyme or reason to it. So I love that type of thinking. And all I've done is I've taken, you know, the Strauss and Howe theory, and which I think uh, has a lot of merit, uh, even yet, I think it it has merit. But I've I've given more of a, of a, I think a, a spin towards technology as being the impetus, the, the, how we move, how these generations 
function and how they're framed. I think it better mm -hmm. comes from the technology that is popping again during sure. our coming of age years. Sure. I, I always had a problem with, um, so if you look at the gen generation X, right? Mm -hmm. Right. That's yeah. 61 to 81. Am, mm -hmm. I, am I right? But traditionally mm -hmm. that's how it's been, uh, how it's yeah. been compartmentalized. Um, I was born in 1980, but I never really thought of myself as generation X. I, I've, I've, enjoyed and came of age with many of the technologies and the the events the historical events that impacted the millennial generation that supposedly came after me so i'm, I'm right at that that tail end of generation yeah. x but perhaps i'm more millennial so i always had an issue with these very <laughs> neat neat divisions between these generations and yeah. and I, I always what, what kind of drew me to uh the information in your book is perhaps this is a lot more fluid than, than we traditionally define them, right? Yeah, and this is also what was popping for me too. I, I like to use the word popping today for some reason. We'll just uh, it's a go good with word. that. The, word, the word. word for today is pop. <laughs> <laughs> but what was, what was also interesting to me in my own study, trying to understand my own self, I was born in 1963. Mm -hmm. And in 1980, uh, there was a book that was released by Landry Jones called Great Expectations. Mm -hmm. And it was about the rise of his generation called the Baby Boomers. Right. Up to that point, this idea of baby boom had not been attached fully to a generation. There were all sorts of names for the baby boom generation. But what hadn't been actually put into place was this frame of 1946 to 1964. Landry Jones did that in 1980. You know, a full, what, 14 years or, or 16 years after the fact, he puts the frames on this baby boom sure. generation, which up to that point had been basically born in the 40s and 50s. That's how it was classically, classically looked at. Well, I was born in 63. I had, and I was suddenly being called a boomer. And I'm going, I don't feel like a boomer. I had the same feeling that you did, right. except I didn't feel a part of the boom generation. Right. And it wasn't until Strauss and Howe comes along and they redefine Gen X. And they didn't even call it Gen X in, in 19, 1991. They called it the uh, 13th generation in their book, Generations. Mm. Uh, 13th generation, which I'm kind of glad didn't stick. That's kind of a of a strange. It was the 13th generation away from the uh, the first generation that came to America. And in, in other words, they had no name. So they just went with 13 because it sounded better than X. Uh, which really X didn't sound much better because they hadn't even, it, it was all coming together and it was just yeah. kind of messy at that point. But, you know, what you're saying is very interesting because I argue in my book that we have to be more fluid. And if you think about my tech generations, they're 20 years long and mm. it, it, it does kind of neatly fit within, you know, the, the zero years, zero to 1920, you know, 1910 to 1930. But what, what, I'm, what I'm finding is that the, you're part of two different technological generations. And if sure. you're someone like yourself who's born in, on, a, on a zero year, you're mm -hmm. actually blessed because you're part of three different technological generations, if you think about it. That's true. And, you know, that's a, and that's where I want to see, you know, I don't use these frames. In fact, when I talk about the radio generation, one of the greatest members of the radio generation was Paul Harvey. I talk about his story in the book, the great Paul Harvey. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the thing is, Paul Harvey was actually born one year earlier than the radio generation. So technically, if you're being you know rigid on the frames, which I'm not, uh, you know Paul Harvey isn't even a member of the generation that really he defined, and you know so I I find it all very fascinating, interesting. Your your generation for a long time was a micro generation. They called exennials. Are you familiar with that term? The uh, I, I may have briefly heard it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There were those who were arguing that anyone born between 1978 and 1983, uh, depending on who you're listening to, was called an exennial. It that's was kind really of a blending. Specific. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's pretty specific. Uh, and I, 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 I like the idea of it being more fluid, um, you know, because, uh, you know, in the 80s. So just I guess I'm talking about myself because this is how I kind of relate to it, uh, to relate to what you wrote. And I also look at what you wrote as a very relevant with respect to my children. I have teenage daughters on TikTok uh, who get all of their information from social media. And I, I, I want to get into that with you because I think it's really interesting. Uh, that's the iTech and the robotics generation that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I grew up in the 80s with <clears throat> TV and then PCs became mm -hmm. extremely important, extremely relevant. 
uh, then into the 90s, you know, we have the internet, and that all of a sudden then defined a lot about what I learned about historical events, um, how I conducted my day to day life, and and then we move into the 2000s, and I'm all, all of a sudden I'm relying a lot on cell phones and then a smartphone at the tail end of that that decade. So I I like the idea of it being more fluid, where you um, the technologies of one generation influence how you come of age, but then so does the technology of an ensuing generation, which you're also a part of. And I think that that's a, a more accurate way to to view people and uh, groups of people and how they come of age, how they um, live their lives. Yeah. Yeah. And, and obviously that's that's why I landed on it and him and argued vociferously for that. Uh, I was hoping Gen Tech would become the book like Generations was. It was mm -hmm. a million selling uh, book that uh, uh, was um, was really a, a landmark book in a sense. Uh, although people, it's more of an academic book. It's a great history, a great sociology, but it's more academic. Yeah. Uh, I wanted my book to be more popular in the sense that uh, let's just rethink these labels. Let's reimagine how we're we're really the names that we're calling. And I can't, I, I don't think we're going to be able to escape now the boomer or the Gen <laughs> X or the millennial. And I don't think Gen Z, Gen Z, that ship has sailed. I'm not, I, I, I've, I've actually basically relented and, 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 and said, you know, it's, it isn't, we're not going to be able to change those labels that those, those have been culturally accepted, but I would like to argue that the new generation emerging now is not the alpha generation. They are the robo generation. They are the mm -hmm. robotics generation. And they're being framed by hair technologies that will explode in the next 10 years. And that's what they're coming of age to. Hair, hair technologies, H-A-I-R, holograms, artificial yep. intelligence, and robotics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah ro uh, the robotics generation. Um, there was one point you made in your book uh, in that last chapter when you're focusing on the robotics. So, so, so just for... For reference purposes, the robotics is anyone born 2020 and afterwards? 20, 2010. 2010, okay. 2010, 2010. to 2030. Yeah, That's iTechs right. would be, again, they, they overlap. Of course. So, yeah, so iTechs would be from 2000 to 2020, right. robos from 2010 to 2030. And then their coming of age years, this is where you're right. They're coming of, because they come of age between 10 and 25. Right. They're now coming of age in 2020 all the way to 2055. Right. So the book actually goes as far as 2055 into right. the future. Uh, so with respect to the robotics generation, mm -hmm. uh, there was a point you made in that chapter concerning people's use of devices, screens, and the, the idea of, you know, are we already potentially – in this robotics phase, you know, people think of robots, robotics as an actual robot, um, like in that Super Bowl commercial that you mentioned, mm -hmm. the Robo Child, um, in, in that chapter. But, you know, you you posit the idea or the suggestion that perhaps we're already there because are our devices, are, do we control our devices or do those devices control us and i think that was a very interesting question to ask <laughs> yeah and this is this is where smart technology uh the artificial intelligence you might might say is really becoming the um the, the great melding of you know i have in my hand the smartphone which technically is a robot when you think about it it's a robot it just doesn't mm -hmm. have legs mm -hmm. it doesn't have it doesn't have movement to it you know i i can but w when you when you add the ability to move something that's artificially intelligent then mm -hmm. it becomes a uh, much more dynamic right and it can become much more eventually depending on how you develop it it can become humanoid in its or Android, depending on how you want to uh, posit right. that, uh, <laughs> as far as its its, its applications. The, the thing about robots, and in the chapter on robots, I talk, uh, you know, I, I want to give a history to every one of these technologies so sure. that we can understand maybe a little bit where they go, because that's what great historians do, or I, I guess great futurists do, is they start and they look for the patterns in history. Right. And when you look at robots, they there really was a, uh, a dividing uh, an impasse, if you will. There were two different types of robots that were being developed, uh, depending on, um, on on how you looked at it. In the West, we were developing more industrial 
uh, type of robots, uh, mechanical robots, uh, the robots, and, and we've had robots since the 1930s. Yeah. Uh, but really, they, they, they haven't been useful to us uh, until about the last 20, 30 years. We found them more useful. In the East, as particularly in Japan, they focus more on creating more human type of robots. They, right. they focused on the androids. They focused on the humanoids. And they've got robots, and all you have to do is go onto YouTube and start uh, doing a search there, and it's it's absolutely fascinating to see some of the robots that they, they look human. There's a, there's a there's a Japanese robot right now that is a reporter. Mm. Uh, she gives the news, and she looks real, and she does interviews uh, mm. because she's artificially intelligent, and that's the big difference, Robert. You have to think. Up until the idea of smart technology emerged, which was in the last 10, 15 years, really, the smart tech has emerged, robots were a lot like a computer. In fact, mm -hmm. when you think about a calculator or a computer, they, they have artificial intelligence, but the artificial intelligence is calculated. Right. It's computed. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. why we called it a computer and a calculator. We calculated, we, we created, humans created the algorithms. But what's going to happen now is that smart technology allows the machine to learn us. Right. We're not calculating anymore. We're not computing anymore. The machine is calculating us depending upon our preferences, our likes, our searches, whatever it is. That machine then is, is, is learning us and then it's presenting to us uh, basically mirroring back what we are, the life that we live. Yeah. And that that's where it gets a little dicey because you know as these machines learn us is it possible for them eventually to even learn themselves so well that they could reproduce themselves? Yeah. You know. <laughs> I mean that brings to mind a couple things. Um obviously the Terminator movies. Yeah. <laughs> uh, me, yeah every, me, every... me being an 80s child, you know, it's one of my favorite Terminator Terminator 2 two of my favorite movies. Um, it also brings to mind, uh, did you watch that documentary on Netflix, The Social Dilemma? It came out a couple years ago, I think. Yes. And I think that that uh, specifically channels what, what you're describing, which is right. these devices and, uh, and these algorithms learn us so well that all we're seeing is content that we want to see or that we're interested in seeing. And I, 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 I did the – after I watched that, I went and I, um, I looked at my – my 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 Facebook account, and I went and I looked through my my friends list, and I've got you know nine hundred and some friends, something. Mm -hmm. Some would say that's anemic uh, <laughs> by today's standards, but I went and looked at uh, some friends that I hadn't seen posted in in quite a while, and I looked up their pages, and sure enough, they had posted very recently. I just hadn't seen mm -hmm. their posts, and I I and I, I I came to the conclusion that I am seeing only posts posts from only a consistent group of 20 to 30 people on a, you know, on, on a daily basis. And I, and I chalked that up to this algorithm, essentially pushing content in front of my eyes that I consistently like to see that I'm only interested in seeing. And I feel like that's, that, that, that's, that's a, a, a very prevalent thing nowadays with Facebook, Instagram, all, all, all of these, uh, all of these platforms. Yeah. Do you agree with that? Oh, well, yeah. In fact, not only do I agree with it, I think that that's actually normal for a social community. I mean, that's Facebook, a good point. That's a really good point. I mean, think about Facebook. What you just mentioned is basically every party I've ever been to. Yeah. You go to a party. Uh, let's say there's 150 people in the room. You tend to associate at best with maybe 30 people. You know, the, the people that are closest to us, the people that, you know, and then you hit the door, you know, you leave. Right. All Facebook does is replicate that type of social arena. The ones that you hang around with the most, the ones that you like, the ones that you communicate with, the ones that you, you know, share their posts. Facebook says, oh, this must be your crowd. Right. So we're just going to keep feeding you your crowd. The problem I have with Facebook isn't that algorithm. I, mm. I think that's actually fairly fairly smart and fairly, you know, I don't mind that at all. Um, you know, it, it forces people actually to go out and to get into other people. As you mentioned, you actually go out and you have to purposely break into a new crowd right. to say hello, you know? Yeah. And I, I, I never like some or share something of theirs. And all of a sudden you'll be getting their content too. Right. Yeah. I never, it's funny. I, I didn't think about it like that until now. It, it, the, the idea that F Facebook 
replicates your other social circles. You know, for yeah, example, yeah. I go, I, I, I go to CrossFit um, or you, you, you think of someone who joins a, a book club or some other, some other group um, you join the groups and the communities that you have commonalities with. And then within those groups, I go to the gym, I speak to the may, maybe the same two or three people there every morning. Yeah. There's other, another 10 to 15 people in the, in the, in this larger room, but I don't, I just don't socialize with them, but that's just the way we humans interact, I suppose. And Facebook essentially yeah. replicates that. I, I yeah. get, I, I can see that. Yeah. The, the problem that I have with Facebook is not that social algorithm. I think that's actually fairly positive and uh, it, it makes sense to me. The problem I have with Facebook is they are censoring posts now. Mm -hmm. Twitter does the same thing. They are able to read your posts. And if you put anything in your post that has their, their code words, you might mm -hmm. say, right. Then then Facebook will actually not allow your post to be seen even by your closest friends. That's what concerns me most about Facebook. Yeah. Uh, I, I, in fact, I posted something this morning uh, on my, I almost as a test. I do it. I do it now as a test, <laughs> but you know, I, I have, um, I have a lot of friends that are in a particular circle. And so I know that if I post something, I do a lot of history and stuff and boom, I've had some, some of my history posts, you know, reach you know, viral stage and that's always right. fascinating to me but on the other hand you know i have um i have friends who who just post a picture of themselves and their wives out having a great supper and they'll have 150 likes and yeah and and all sorts of comments and and then i i will post something really meaningful very uh, insightful historical or political slightly political and yeah. boom nobody likes it and I know that's not true because I have people say to me, I read all of your stuff. And I always tell them, if you read my stuff and you like it, then like it, because I'll guarantee you that's the only way to keep that out there in the stream. <clears throat> Otherwise, because Facebook is actually working against those now. And right. Twitter does the same thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, Twitter, well, we, we have, um, I mean, they've admitted it uh, with, res I mean, a relevant story right now, the, uh, the Hunter Biden laptop. Exactly. Um, back yeah. then, you know, when, when when that story broke, the New York Post broke that story in October 2020. Um, I read, a, I think it was a, an NPR article explaining how Facebook had admitted that they were de-emphasizing posts concerning that story. And then Twitter outright just banned any posts linking to the New York Post article. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, kind of bringing this back within the framework of your book. If you have social media platform, if you have a generation that's coming of age through the through these social media platforms, they they use. I mean, my teenage daughters actually don't use Facebook at all, but they use TikTok a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so let's if we put TikTok in that same group, you have these platforms that continue continuously put content in front of you that you're they know you're going to like, they know you're going to be interested in, and if they're censoring certain information, how does that impact that generation as they they come of age into their 20s and 30s and so on and so forth yeah well i, I mean that's a that's a whole book in itself is just talking about that that thought there I, as you were as you're talking though what what really strikes me about social media today is how superficial it has to be mm -hmm. you know twitter at one time you couldn't do a post that was longer than what 127 characters or right. it was really really short uh, and that's what I call it micro communication. Right. It's really shortened attention spans. And, you know, the average YouTube video is like four minutes long. And uh, the Twitter and, and Snapchat's another one that, you know, that has very short uh, types of communication. And Facebook's the same way. You know, if, those who really excel at Facebook are the ones who can create the memes that, uh, that, <laughs> that that can say something in one or two sentences. I call it the Doogie Howser effect. Uh, I don't know yeah. if you remember Doogie Howser from the I 90s. I do, actually. Uh, I'll pull a cultural cultural uh, show out on you. You know, Neil Patrick Harris starred in that. I remember he was that like show. 13 years old. You know, he was a he was a doctor and and, and everything. But at the end of every show, if you remember Doogie Howser, mm. he would sit down at his computer and he would type a one or two sentence summary to the episode right. he was he was tweeting long before anybody else was tweeting yeah but he was doing it on his personal computer and i think what's happened is that it's made us very superficial in how we we get our information and it's also made us uh really gravitate that's why we do tend to like our echo chambers 
whether you're conservative yeah. or or left, right, or or pink or yellow or blue or red or whatever you might be, uh, we like our echo chambers because they're safe. They're safe spaces for us to be able to get the news that we believe is true. Right. You know, and that that's that's the biggest problem we have today is anybody that confronts our 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 belief systems, uh, and the media has been. The, the hack job on this whole thing because you don't dare go against the, the the mainstream or i call it the left stream media narrative if you go against that you're considered you know unloyal to america you're yeah you're a, a putin advocate you're a you're 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 you're, you're pushing russian disinformation uh, <laughs> or you're a, you're a trump you're a trump freak yeah i mean there's all sorts of things that they yeah. do to kind of label you mm-hmm. and the funny thing is is when you look at the left stream media they're doing the exact same thing. They're pushing the disinformation. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. They're pushing the fake news. Yeah, I, I think the um uh I think human beings generally, or it seems to me, and you can uh, tell me if, if you if you think I'm right or not, I, I think human beings generally gravitate towards short but impactful uh messages and whomever is delivering those messages, if you can understand how to do that effectively, um, you can usually build a fairly large audience. And I, I think politicians are probably the prime example of this. If you, do you remember Herman Cain? Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, his, his slogan when he campaigned for president back in, I think it was 2011, 2012 was the, his nine, nine, nine plan, mm-hmm. uh, his tax plan where I think it was a 9% uh, income tax, 9% sales tax, 9%, uh, was a corporate tax. I, I forget what it was, but yeah. Yeah. But that was a slogan, nine, nine, nine. And it was, it, it, for a while there, he was the the most popular presidential candidate, and then they hit him with the what, what the Democrats usually do. They find they they pull out somebody who can they can accuse him uh, through through whom they can accuse him of uh, sexual harassment or what what have you, and then that that derailed his presidential uh, hopes. But for a while there, that slogan nine 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 was so impactful, so effective, and so interesting for people because people love the idea of lower taxes at least. Um, on, on, on my side of the aisle, presumably yeah. on yours, but that, you know, I remember there was one instance where they asked him about, yeah, he, he gave a, 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 an accurate answer, an inaccurate answer about some foreign policy issue at the time. And it was, you know, went viral on, uh, in, in the media, a reporter stopped him when he was leaving at some point, uh, some campaign event, and they asked him about that, that answer. And he just responds with, nine 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 and keeps walking <laughs> yeah um, so I, 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 I do you agree that or do you disagree with me that human beings generally generally gravitate towards those types of short messages and that's why twitter became so popular um and the, the more impactful the more effective those messages are the more appeal they have yeah and i i think that's because um you know in general uh people appreciate clarity and mm-hmm. I think that if you can say something in a way that's clear and concise, as opposed to something that's ambiguous and not concise, you know, uh, the, the problem again with social media and really the more information, this is the other thing most people don't realize, but every day there is more and more information, including novel new information being pumped out. And I, I don't know if you're, um, if you're, if you're familiar with, uh, I'm sure you are, you know, anybody who's got at least a half, half a brain is, is familiar or understands that, you know, there's a, there's a huge, um, garbage dump out in the Pacific ocean. That's mm-hmm. just floating. It's a floating garbage dump of plastics and stuff. And of course, fish are getting caught in it, but it's, it's been floating out there for years and it's just been gathering. It's just, and it's slowly moving around every now and then bits of it break off and they, they wash ashore and we have to deal with them. But there's this huge bunch of garbage out there. We call it flotsam and jetsam, mm-hmm. right? Flotsam, flotsam and jetsam. And the thing about flotsam and jetsam is that as it's floating, you know, uh, you, you come up on that, You've got to go through that in order to get to any type of substance underneath. And and I think that's the problem with a social media culture right now is that so many of us. And and again, I think that's why echo chambers are are, are, our gravitational pole here is because we know in our echo chambers we're safe. You know, we know that we can we can listen and go, Okay, I may not agree with everything he says, but I agree with most of what he or she says. And and I'm good. But, you know, you go. 
you, when you think about all the information that's floated across uh, on an average day at you, you know, to, to just wait around in the garbage thinking that there's a pearl in there somewhere just yeah. is is maddening. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, for many of us, we prefer to to have the, the, the gems out there, pull up those pearls, show us those pearls uh, so we don't have to do that work. And, you know, so I can I can understand that that type yeah. of, um, of appeal. Right. And but then, of course, the danger is if you are relying on a, and I, I'd like to think that I don't have this problem because I, I think I've vetted <laughs> enough of these sources of information uh, to know where to find the truth if that's what I want to find. Well, that's usually what I try to find. But it, there, there is a danger um, if you're not interested in perhaps reading or surveying information or a viewpoint that you don't agree with. There is a danger that if you're relying on the same sources of information, whether through TikTok or some other social media platform, there's a danger then that you are learning and basing your opinions off of the wrong information. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that, for example, the Hunter Biden laptop is is a prime example of this. W when you had media outlets in October 2020 that were refusing to report this, mm -hmm. Twitter is completely censoring any links to that New York Post article. Facebook is de-emphasizing posts concerning that information. Half of Biden voters apparently had no idea about this laptop. Yeah. And uh, I think it, I, I forget what percentage of them. There was a, a, um, a poll that I, 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 I saw and I forget the exact number, but a, a good number of them uh, opined that they would not have voted for him had they right. known. They would have changed, changed their vote. Yeah. And I think it was it was yeah. enough. It was probably would have been enough votes that it would have swung the election. So yeah. there is a danger, right? If you're relying on the same sources of information, if all you watch is CNN, you're going to have a certain worldview. And, yeah. and, and well, I, I would argue it's the same way if you come at it from the right. That's true. Absolutely. You know, I mean, if Fox News is the only news you watch, good grief. What benefit is that? Mm -hmm. I mean, I watch all sorts of news. I, you know, I watch the CNNs. I watch the NBCs. I watch the I, I, I'm, I'm not a real fan of MSNBC because I tend to want to throw things at the TV. You know, I, I just it's not really news on MSNBC. Right. It's more of a political, you know, hatchet job on on, on that. Uh, I always I, I think it's interesting just speaking about the Hunter Biden thing. We spent four years and I say four years because I I, I actually watched this from the very beginning. But every night NBC News would come out with a new Trump bombshell news story <laughs> every night. And they used the word bombshell so yeah. much that I started noting it. And I kept telling my wife, "Why? Wow, let's let's what's the bombshell tonight?" Sure. And sure enough, sure. there every night, and 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 you know, there were some days where you didn't have a bombshell, but almost every night they had a different bombshell right. story related to the Trump administration. And yet, this this uh, Hunter Biden story is probably the biggest bombshell that we've had politically mm -hmm. in years, maybe even since Watergate, because it has. You, you want to talk Russian collusion? You know, you want to talk Chinese collusion. I mean, there there is all sorts of, of, of bad stuff connected to this particular story. And no, the left stream press did not want America to know about it. Uh, they, they wanted to spin it as Russian disinformation from the very beginning right. uh, because they knew that that type of narrative would sell. And you want to know something? You, in, in the year 2020, we were already biting the apple of bad narratives. Yeah. From George Floyd and Black Lives Matter, those are bad narratives, people. Right. You know, uh, I'm, 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 I'm. This is where the historian and historian in me gets a little bit uh, agitated, because yeah. um, you know I found out Black History Month. I do a lot of, of writing on on uh, black um, black culture for. I read, I read some of those posts. They were very interesting. Yeah, I, I want to expose people to some of the great stories out there that you yeah. never hear about. And I do that during Black History Month. But one of my posts that got, got a little bit of play out there, and, and it was surprising to me because, you know, I watched the show Roots uh, back in, the, in 1977. I sat there, all of America, we sat there and watched this Alex Haley miniseries on television called Roots. Most of us bought the book. I have the yeah. book sitting on my shelf. Mm. You know, uh, it's, it, I always thought that was history. Yeah. I always thought that was Alex Haley's history. 
it's right. not. No, <laughs> it's not. It was. It was. It was actually a fabricated story. Yeah. It was a novel, and yeah. it was passed off as history, and yet it created what I call the slave narrative in America, because up until Martin Luther King, up until 1968. There was this liberty narrative in America. If you went into black America, you heard a liberty narrative. It was a victor narrative. That's what Booker T. Washington preached. It's mm -hmm. what Frederick Douglass preached. It's what Sojourner Truth preached. It's what Jackie Robinson preached. It's what Rosa Parks preached. It was, we are not going to take it, but we're going to, we're going to, we are victors here and we're going right. to keep pushing till we win, you know? So we're not judged by the color of our skin, but by the content of our character. Right. But that all blew up in, in the late 70s with the Alex Haley novel where where suddenly we became sympathetic to a to a story, a narrative that wasn't even true. Yeah. And now we live by this slave narrative. I just saw today there was a there's a church in Chicago that refuses to to uh, have during Lent. They have given up for Lent any hymn, any writing, anything that's connected to white people in the name of Christianity. In the name of being united as a body, they say this, yeah. we're going to be united as a body of people, as all races. And I'm going, but yet you're saying, if I'm I'm white, I have nothing to say. And you're going yeah. to basically throw away all the hymns of the great um, white writers. It makes no sense. Yeah, I, I that that's alarming. I didn't know about that. Yeah. Um, that Roots, I, I remember watching i never read the book but i remember watching the miniseries and they showed it to us in school yeah. uh, and, and i was in i was in elementary school late 80s early 90s and they're showing us this miniseries as part of our our our, our history curriculum you thought and it was I'll, true I'll, I'll, i i absolutely i thought it was true i did too and Don't i you know i remember though. looking at yeah i remember looking at the uh in the i think it was in the first two episodes the character who played punta quinte mm -hmm. That that's that's a young Jordy LaForge. Yeah, that's LeVar <laughs> Burton. Trek, the next generation. Yeah, LeVar Burton. Exactly. And so I it it's um that I, I read that 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 post you uh you published concerning roots and 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 the fact that it wasn't wasn't true, but it's 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 crazy how something that isn't true could literally inform that hundreds of thousands, millions of people and yeah. form their view viewpoint and they will shape and, and develop an opinion based on something that isn't true. Right. And when you confront them with the truth, they think you're crazy. Yeah. Well, we have, we have all sorts of narratives like that. Sure. Oh I mean, yeah. You can, you can, there are all sorts of false narratives that we believe to be true. I mean, you know, I'm a, I'm somebody, I come from a, of a religious arena, a theological arena. I actually am a creationist. I believe God created the heavens and the earth. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't have to believe that, but to say that evolution is scientific fact mm -hmm. is, is to me, you know, pushing a narrative now. It's a nice story. But mm -hmm. I mean, you can look at how we handled COVID, the, the, the vaccines. Those were all narratives. So it's, yeah. it's theological narratives. It's sociological narratives. It's even scientific narratives get pushed as being true when, you know, we, and we eliminate any type of dissent in these things. That's the problem I have. It's not that these narratives, we've always had narratives that were pushed and we call it spinning or wagging the dog, you might say. But this idea of spinning a narrative. But what's happened today is that the the left has very um, they they literally mobilized. I don't know if you I saw this story last night. Tucker Carlson had has some pretty good stories on these yeah. things. But Tucker had a story last night of a of a gal who made a comment. Uh, she was a, a a news gal for um for a major radio station there and conservative radio station in. Uh, in uh, Washington, D.C., and she made a Twitter comment about uh, uh, Kamala Harris's uh, brown outfit at the uh, State of the Union State address. Union, yeah. And, you know, it was it was a benign. I mean, I look at it and go, what did she say? It was so I mean, it's it's obviously interesting. Uh, it's 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 kind of entertaining, you know, but she kind of referred to, you know, UPS used to have this this statement. What can brown do for you? And right. she spun it off of that. And she said, what can Brown do for you? And obviously nothing. You know, Kamala Harris is not doing anything for you. Right, she right. got fired for that That's incredible. by a conservative radio station. That's incredible. And it was because of the opposition that said, oh, she's being racist because she used the word Brown in a derogatory way. And I'm going, mm. what? 
How is that racist? And uh, you know? yeah, that's um, it, it, the the left, especially the as, as you mentioned it, the uh, as you identify them the le- the left 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 wing media. They weaponize phrases, um, and, and, and phrases that are completely unintentional at times. People don't. People often just don't know what they're saying. And in, and in, in an environment when where you, if you're in an environment or an occupation or profession where you talk, you tend to talk a lot, or maybe yeah. you're recorded saying a lot of different things. Every now and then, we, we, you know, we fudge things. We 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 say something we shouldn't say. We we make a mistake, sure. but it, it's completely unintentional. And they weaponize. The left will weaponize this. We, weaponize a mistake that you made. And they, they love to make you seem as if you're racist. That that yeah. is the the number one attack that I've always seen. Uh, they did it with recently with Joe Rogan. They did it with um, um, I'll never forget. Uh, did, are you familiar with the governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, he yeah. he was actually my roommate in law school. Really? Um, yeah. yeah. He when he won the nomination um, to run as as the gov as a Republican for the governor of Florida, the first interview out of the bat um, after the the primary results came in. So his opponent was Andrew Gillum, an African-American mm-hmm. Democrat. Um, Ron said something to the, I don't forget what, what the exact quote was, but he said something about, uh, we don't want to monkey this up or something to that effect. Yeah. Um, and he, I know, I know Ron, I know him and he did not, he has, he doesn't have a racist bone in his body. He didn't mean it that way. He just, yeah. and, but he, I, I remember him very well and he often, tripped over his own words and said stupid things. And I, I know that that was just a mistake. The media down there ran with that for at least two weeks. They tried to paint him as a racist and, 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 and do all sorts of things with that. It, it never stuck. And he just kind of plowed right through it. He's very unapologetic. Um, but they, the, 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 uh, this singular focus at times, uh, with a word like that or a, a statement someone says or a quip or a phrase I think it's driven a lot by these platforms and and the way this generation um, yeah. is shaped through through this technology, right. right? Right, and that's why getting back to the the book Gen Tech and yeah. generations and such, I, I really think that uh, well, from a sociological view, I've often argued that there are there are there have been a lot of losses in our culture. When you go back to the 1950s, about every decade, there's been a, a cultural loss. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for example, in the 1950s, there was a loss of innocence. You know, that was when the Playboy culture uh, emerged and there was a general loss of innocence. In the 60s, there was a loss of authority. Every institution, every authoritative institution was attacked during the yeah. 1960s. And so there's a loss of authority. In the 70s, there was a loss of morality. I mean, that was when everything kind of became what, you know, do what you feel, you know, Mm -hmm. whatever you feel feel best. In the 80s, there was a loss of faith. I think that was where, even though that was the great Reagan decade, there was a loss of faith, not just in America, but also in in God. I mean, that was the emergence of the agnostics and the atheists in -hmm. in that decade. Uh, In the 90s, we we saw a loss of respect. Uh, when you when you think about it, a lot of it was that grunge culture wearing your hat backwards and yeah. tattoos and all that stuff, but there was a loss of respect in the two thousands. There was a loss of security. You know, when you think about how right. how that happened, but you know, and I was thinking about okay, so what did we lose in the last ten years? Because I was making this thought just a few years ago, and I think what we lost in the twenty tens was truth. We've lost truth. We don't know what's true anymore. Mm-hmm. And it's because there are people out there that spin everything. And then if you actually go, well, wait a minute, I have a question on that, or I don't agree with that, or let me give another idea on that, or dissent in any way, you are framed, you're labeled, you're canceled, you're censored. That's the problem, you know? Yeah. And you know, what it's going to take is for revolutionaries, uh, true revolutionaries to stand up and say, we're not going to take this anymore. You know, go ahead and cancel me. Go ahead and censor me. Yeah. You know, uh, well, that, that's that you can you can do that, but it doesn't change me. I know right. I'm not a racist. Right. I know I'm not a racist. Do I have prejudices? Now, see, this is the difference. Mm-hmm. We all have prejudices. I happen to prefer prejudice means that you prejudge, right? I happen to, I happen to have prejudice towards Coca-Cola over Pepsi. Mm -hmm. You know, Uh, you give me a Coca-Cola any day. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a Pepsi fan. Mm -hmm. I have, I have prejudices towards, I I like where I live. I live out here in the great Northwest. I live in the mountains. I'm not, 
I'm not somebody who likes to live on the plains, you know, or in the, the humid Southeast. You know, I, we have prejudices, but sure a prejudice do. does not mean that we're, we, we become a racist. If we want to hang around a certain group of people, that doesn't make us prejudice. Right. You know, I, my, I have a lot of black friends and they go to black churches and they go mm -hmm. to black socials and they all hang around one another. I don't look at them as being prejudiced or, ra or racist. They right. just prefer that. There's nothing wrong with that. You right. know, it's OK. But but we do get into this thing where we start labeling and libeling. And that's not good. No, I, I, I agree. And uh, personally, I'm a, I'm a Pepsi guy. Myself, oh, although well, uh, I, I, although interview, I, I interview over <laughs> interview, although I, I mean, I, I generally stay away from uh, from soda, um, one way okay. or another. But uh, when I used to drink them, I, I definitely favored Pepsi. So all right, but again, well, we're all we're all we all entitled to our our opinions and our our preferences, yeah. right? Yeah, um, I mean, the wrong ones, you know, like, like yeah, like mine. You know, I like to say that I actually say stuff myself just to argue with myself. You know? <laughs> well, we all have those internal. Yeah. arguments especially in the shower right yeah and, and yeah. i always come out on top and when right. i argue with myself in the shower i always <laughs> win my own arguments i don't i, I know it's i'm 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 undefeated <laughs> um it, it, there's is there a way um because I, I think i think we both agree there 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 is a danger with the, the, the these later generations um re relying so heavily on screens on social media and, and how those platforms censor certain pieces of, of information that don't fit whatever narrative they they sponsor. Is there a way to, to find or, or to, to, to find some commonality um, with people whom with whom we, 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 we may disagree um, that that'll help alleviate the dangers that those, that those um, platforms present. And I'll give you an example. So I, I am a, um, I'm, I'm an attorney by trade and I, right. I, I going, you mentioned COVID earlier. I, I filed something like 20 to 30 lawsuits um, mm -hmm. on behalf of various clients, challenging many different types of COVID restrictions, ranging from uh, uh, state sponsored shutdowns to mask mandates. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm currently involved in a vaccine mandate lawsuit. <coughs> One of the individuals, uh, the first mask mandate lawsuit I filed was on behalf of an, uh, an individual in New Hampshire um, he, and I'm, I'm a, I'm a Trump voter. Uh, I'm a conservative. Um, he <coughs> was vehemently opposed to this, this mask mandate that was passed by the municipality in which he lived. And to my surprise, he was a Bernie Sanders supporter. Um, and, and we, we, we both agreed that that was, it was very interesting and fascinating that he is as far on the other side of the aisle, as you could possibly be from me, but yet we both agreed that this was bad policy. Um, <coughs> is there a way to find similar commonalities um, amongst groups of people that will help alleviate the dangers that these platforms present for, for these generations as they come of age? Well, yes. And I, I think it starts by everybody taking a deep breath and starting with a level of respect, mm -hmm. you know, remember what we lost in the 1990s was respect. Right. And as a culture, we've lost respect. And I think, I think we can bring back these things. I think we can bring back truth. We can bring back respect. We can bring back security. You know, we can bring back uh, faith and morality and such, but those are all going to be intentional. Mm. Uh, it's, it's going to be, um, it's going to be a, a culture that says, you know what, we, have gone down a wrong path here and we need to change and we need to think about how we, you know, what got us in this mess in the first place. And, you know, I don't think it's censorship. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm one of the first to say that, you know, when it comes to Facebook, I, I don't like the fact that they do censoring. Uh, they have censorship or Twitter, these big tech, but it's their program. It's their platform. If sure. they want to censor, they, they have that right. Let them do it. You know, mm -hmm. um, it's just to me, I, I, I just think a more wide open, more open source would be would be more uh, more interesting and helpful. But at the same time, you know, how open, you know, we, we want free speech as long as the speech is something we agree with. Right. You know, uh, we want we want freedom to live our lifestyle as long as it doesn't be 
produce a lifestyle that we disagree with. And then at that point we go, oh, wait a minute. You know, I find it interesting that Christians, for example, Christians who have been the most open to allowing people to, to pursue alternative lifestyles uh, and, and have been the ones that have been, uh, you know, yes, there have been times where, where Christians have put a line in the sand saying, you know, we shouldn't be going here. This isn't right. good. But it's still, you know, hey, we're, we're going to, we're, in the name of Jesus, we'll tolerate it. Well, now it's Christianity that's really the alternative lifestyle in America. That's interesting. If you want, if you want to, if you want to be, go against the grain, mm -hmm. come out as a conservative Christian. There are a lot of Christians that aren't conservative. Come out as a conservative Christian or a right. particular brand of Christianity. That's even more like the evangelical, mm -hmm. um, where you actually believe that abortion is murder. Right. You actually believe that homosexuality is a sin against God. You know, if you, if you get into that camp, you are labeled, you are libeled, you are censored, you are canceled. Sure. And that, and yet those are the Christians that historically have been the ones most open to allowing people to explore their alternative lifestyles. Right. I mean, I think that that, I, well, while that may be labeled radioactive or uh, alternative, I, I think that that likely represents or if you take different factions of uh, Christian conservatives and, and other conservatives, that's likely the silent majority in, in, in mm -hmm. the country as, and um, I, you, you, you wrote about this, you touched upon this a little bit in your book. Um, the, the, there was this wave of support for, for Trump in 2016. And you, mm -hmm. you posited it that it, it may have been driven in part by the fact that um, generation Xers, if we're going to rely on the, uh, the traditional definitions of these generations. It was the first time in history that they outnumbered the boomers in the vote. Yeah. And generation X was, had developed this, this deep level of distrust mm -hmm. for, yeah. uh, to me, I think it was just government uh, and the swamp and what, whatever you want to call it. But they, that, that is, and in my opinion, it remains the silent majority. There's that represents the majority of the people in this country. And I don't think that notwithstanding right. 2020 and election security issues aside, I don't think that that's changed. Hmm. No, I, I happen to agree with you there. I think that and it's interesting as someone who did uh, a lot of posting politically um, on um, between 2016 and 2020. Uh, it, it's interesting that, um, you know, there were a lot of battles on Facebook. I have friends who said that they got tired of all the politics on Facebook and that's why they got off Facebook. And yeah, that's OK. You know, to me, I like I find it fascinating just to hear other people's perspective, even mm -hmm. if I don't agree with it. I find it interesting to hear their perspective. And I, I'm, I'm willing to, hey, listen, go ahead and share and I'll, I'll read and I'll I'll entertain and I'll I'll think about it. But, you know, if I disagree in the end, it doesn't mean that, that I hate you. It doesn't mean that I'm afraid right. of you. I mean, that that's, that's ridiculous. Um, but uh, we, you know, what's, what's happening is I do think that there is a very silent uh, majority in this culture. And what we learned in the Trump years is that if you, if you were a supporter of Trump, you learned to shut up. Okay? <laughs> that's what you learned to do. In fact, the very thing that most people wanted Trump to do was to shut up. Yeah. Um, that's what that's Biden what told him that in the debate. He told him to shut up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we, we need to we need to we, we've learned to shut up uh, because we've learned to go along to get along. And we do that. I think conservatives do that because there's a respect. We still respect people. Mm -hmm. I think conservatives still respect. You know, we don't run around saying Biden is not my president. You know, we may disagree with Biden. You may see uh, a faction. I say it's a very small faction of the of the people that, that say F, F you Biden and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And I think that that is if you're a conservative doing that, I think that, you know, you need to stop it. You know, mm -hmm. it does not do conservatism any good uh, for that for that type of, of disrespect, you right. know. But at the same time, you know, where did we get the F you Biden? It, it came from the F you Trump. People, the, the left was, I mean, there are all sorts of F you Trump bumper stickers. Oh, and, God. You know, yeah. they didn't do the flag thing. Le the left doesn't do the flag thing, but they know how to do bumper stickers pretty well, you know? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, the, 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 uh, the F Joe Biden stuff, I mean, it, it's funny as far as it goes, I suppose. And, um, but it, well, let's go, it, Brandon. Largely, I'm sorry. Let's go, Brandon is funny. I, it, 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 the way that came about is certainly funny. And it's, oh, and yeah. I, I find it hilarious, but it, 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 it it's as far it's funny as far as it goes and it doesn't really 
advance a substantive conversation about no. all of the bad things that Biden is doing uh, through his through his administration. Um, and uh, it, it you know, so I, I, I think that 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 is an un, an unfortunate byproduct um, right. of and, and essentially the the uh, the insi- the 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 hesitation that many of in that silent majority exhibit uh, the the willingness to shut up as you mentioned that is an unfortunate byproduct of the these platforms and um, how this generation these generations are, are 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 coming of age through these platforms that information is censored you are attacked for having an opposing viewpoint and so you you'd much rather just shut up rather than continue with what you would hope would be an, an engaging discussion, but it often isn't. Yeah. Well, we've been here before. This, this is, yeah, this is exactly, this is exactly what created the American revolution to begin with was mm-hmm. King George telling the revolutionaries or the, the colonials to shut up. Mm-hmm. You know, you guys just get in line, you pay your taxes, you do your duty and you don't, you don't talk. You don't, mm-hmm. you don't create waves against the King, but we got a new King in town, you know, we, we've, you know, the, the, the Democratic Party really has, has shown its colors in the last year. You know, I, I find, yeah, I find a lot of the stuff that's been done. My, my parents are, are, are Cuban immigrants mm-hmm. uh, and they fled a totalitarian regime in the 1960s as, you know, they uprooted in their teenage years and, and brought over here with nothing but the clothes on their backs. Um, you know, when I'm seeing uh, an administration mandate a vaccine for 80 to million, 100 million Americans. You know, my dad would tell me, I've never seen anything like this before. I haven't yeah. seen anything like this since Cuba. And that is alarming to me. Um, when when you have a, a federal administration forcing people to do something simply because they want them to, simply because those people exist. That is, I've never seen anything like that. I never thought we'd get to this point. And there was some of this stuff in the early 1900s with Woodrow Wilson and all that, and that's that's probably beyond the scope of this conversation, but it, it's alarming to me. Although we we didn't treat the Spanish flu like we did the coronavirus. No, we you didn't. We, no. we did not. You know, there wasn't. An, In fact, I mean, it, we called it the Spanish flu. We still call it the Spanish flu. Isn't that racist? Yeah. We couldn't call this the Chinese flu. No, that was true. racist, but the Spanish flu is okay. Yeah, I don't think there was one. I think I read about this somewhere, and maybe you might know a little bit more about it than I do, but. I don't think there was one presidential address about the Spanish flu at the time. No. Right. No. And in fact, churches were encouraged because people at that point did gather in, in, in communities within the church. The church was the center of every, every community. Yeah. So that was the largest gathering spots. And there was encouragement in some of the hot spots by local leaders. Let's not have church on Sunday so that we can keep people from keep people. Well, let's, you know, yeah. they were they were quarantining the sick. That's what we did in the Spanish flu. We right. quarantined the sick. You masked up if you were sick. Right. We didn't, you know, it, 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 it was totally Fo- focused. Time. It's called focused protection. Yeah. Um, I've talked to many I, in, in, in connection with all of these lawsuits that I've, I've handled. I've talked to many um, physicians, epidemiologists, um, experts in these areas, um, uh, you know, industrial hygienists concerning masks and such. And that the. the what we should have done with coronavirus was focus protection. It's obviously a virus that impacts a selective portion of the population, of the population, 65 and up you're at risk, especially if you have comorbidities, but we didn't do that. We just adopted a one size fits all approach. And it, it to me, it just, I, I know if I, I'd like to lean on this uh, on, uh, towards the notion that it was incompetence rather than something more nefarious yeah, but it th- th- these one size fits all approaches did not make any sense. Right. Um, we should have adopted a more focused approach: protect the elderly, protect those that are at risk, and let the rest of us get on with our daily lives. Um, it seems seems to be what what was done during the Spanish flu, but for some reason, um, it would have been that, interesting that, to see what would have happened if Trump had actually. Uh, was reelected on on that particular issue because I right. you know Trump was not a mandate guy. Uh, he I don't think it, I, I think he would have allowed if if a state wanted to mandate it for their employees. I think that probably would have happened. But you know the Biden administration 
definitely took a whole different approach. Sure. But it shouldn't surprise us. This has been the scorched earth policies of a of a party from the very beginning. Yeah. I mean, they they basically learned it when when the Union armies went through Atlanta and scorched mm-hmm. that earth, and and they came back and they they've been doing it ever since. The Ku Klux Klan was nothing more than a scorched earth uh, political uh, wing of the Democrat Party. You know, but we don't want we can't talk about that type of history because, right. uh, my goodness, that would be um, be improper. Uh, but we forget. Well, don't you care? Really don't you care about people's health? Don't you care about safety? Yeah. That's what those are. the Those are the uh, th- th- those are the attacks I would receive when I was um, pushing these lawsuits and, and helping people challenge a lot of this stuff. I, mean, I was helping so many parents challenge school district mask mandates. Yeah. And I, I mean, I had judges labeling me irresponsible. Um, uh, you know, wholly inappropriate, the things that we were doing when we're just voicing our concerns and challenging a policy with which we disagree. Uh, right. But it, there was never any engagement on the substance of that. It was always, um, we always received the more superficial ad hominem style yeah. attack, attack the messenger sort of thing. And it's, it's extremely, it's unfortunate. And I think it's in large part driven by a lot of the the, the the centering of information that the media engages in and that these platforms engage in. Um, and uh, there's so much information, so much truth out there concerning COVID masks, vaccines, and so on and so forth that it's just never been, was never um, widely distributed right. during that time because of, of, of how these technology, uh, how this technology has impacted uh, the flow of that information. Yeah. And what I find fascinating about this too is you you did, dealt with it more from the legal perspective mm-hmm. uh and you know i dealt with it more from a scientific mm-hmm. you know for me for me a lot of the mandates didn't make sense the mass mandates because there was we're actually finding out now there are studies that are showing that with kids mm-hmm. that having these kids masked up for a year almost two years now you know actually has done more against their mental health it's done Absolutely. more to deteriorate their emotional and mental health and Absolutely. to damage their learning that they had so we, we've got kids who basically have lost two years of their life mm-hmm. to to just a, a simple mandate that you need to mask up whereas mm-hmm. if we had approached it with you know what if you're sick stay home that's what we've always done so if you're right. sick stay home the, the biggest i have to be careful because this this is so difficult to prove scientifically <laughs> But, but to me, the biggest issue with COVID was this whole idea that you could have COVID and not have symptoms, asymptomatic COVID, because we've never had a disease that's been asymptomatic. Every disease right. has symptoms. That's how you knew you had the disease. Right. But to say you have COVID, and, and this is why we, we were, even some of the testing was, was terrible because we were getting false positives. Yeah. I had COVID. I was over COVID for two weeks and was still testing positive. Well, that's because okay. uh, the the PCR tests, which is yeah. the, the test that was predominantly used and, and to some extent it still is used to di- diagnose whether you have COVID, is, is inherently a very unreliable test. It yeah. will still uh, produce a positive result if up to 90 days after you were infectious. Yeah. And so yeah. that 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 led to think about that. I mean, if you were infectious for maybe what nine, ten days, yeah, you can still test positive another 75, 80 days after that. Think about how many false positive tests we likely had as a result of the use of that test. And right. and those those test results were that's how we formulated public policy. We have a rise in COVID cases, mm-hmm. therefore we need to do XYZ. Um, that that never made any sense to me. And we knew about the the inherent unreliability of PCR tests back in 2020. We knew that. Yeah. Um, by the way, I, I was one of those who had COVID apparently and didn't know about it. I yeah. tested. I, there was. What? You're Martin, still standing? You're still I'm alive? Still, I'm, I'm doing. Yeah, I'm doing very well, yeah. actually, health wise. <laughs> La- last March, I, I went down to uh, Florida. My dad's a physician. I said, you know, for shits and giggles, run, let's do a COVID uh, antibody test. I just I'm just curious because. Yeah. I was one of those who, you know, I, I, I went out, I went to restaurants, I freak, I hung out with my friends during the lockdown uh, phase of all of this. And I, I wasn't worried about it because I was looking at the data coming out of Italy and this, this virus mm-hmm. was killing elderly, unfortunately. But if you were yeah. healthy and you know, young, middle aged, you were generally OK. I, I, I took the antibody test, came back positive. I had had COVID and I just didn't know about it. 
Right. Um, so th th the idea that you could have this virus, you don't have symptoms, but yet we still have to lock you down and quarantine you if you test positive for it. That never made any sense to me either. Science was all over the map on this thing. Well, the I, yeah, the, the, there, there was, we had, I mean, we had very, very smart people and I've yeah. talked to some of these people, yeah. um, putting out very well-informed opinions and evaluations of what was going on, what we should do about it. They were just being ignored. Yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, in the case of YouTube censored, their videos were right. censored. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because it, we didn't want that type of information made available. Yeah. When I, when I get, when I come across an opinion with which I disagree, what I try and do is ask the other person, what do you base that on? Right. Right. Where did you get that? Where, what information are you basing that opinion on? And a yeah. perfect example of this was my, my 14 year old daughter, an avid TikToker. Um, she comes to me and says, and, and well, she, she posted something on her Instagram about uh, the parental rights and education bill in Florida, that which has been dubbed the don't say gay bill, right? Right. By the media. And um, she posted something about it being discrimination and this and that. And uh, it basically, she also posted something to the effect of that the bill um, authorizes teachers to out students to their parents. Okay. Um, I, and I, I texted her, I said, where did you get that information from? Mm -hmm. Is it from TikTok? She said, well, yes. And I said, okay. And I, I, I found the bill. I screenshot it. I sent it to her. I said, this is what the bill actually says. And she, she, she walked back her, you know, her, her, her opinion about it. But it, it, it I think that's a perfect encap encapsulation of yeah. how dangerous some of these platforms can be when they're pushing out, when whomever you follow, whatever you see contains a certain slice of information right. it's only 10% of right. the truth yeah. um and then we 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 end up with entire swaths of society believing yeah. one thing and it's it's impossible to achieve any kind of progress well i think it starts in the schools actually robert i think it starts there right. and I, you know i'm a professor I, I i i know what the classrooms like i can also tell you as I told my students that I can't teach you everything I think you need to know. So I'm going to actually self-censor information. I'm going to tell you what I think you need to know. And a lot of these kids today, they're getting very bad education. They're not being taught how to think. They're being taught what to think. And it's indoctrination that's going on in our educational facilities and, and institutions. Uh, and it's, it's very prevalent at the college level. Mm -hmm. We lose a lot of, a lot of kids uh, at the college level, you know, just because they, they trot off and they listen to some, uh, some, some fancy, you know, lecturer and, and with a lot of degrees behind their name. And, you know, uh, Hey, I've got the degrees. I got to tell you, I've, I've, I've sat with some of these guys mm -hmm. and, and they're not as brilliant as you think they are kids. They're mm -hmm. really not as brilliant. And even the stuff that I'm saying, I always say, you know, if, if I've said something wrong, tell me, I want to, I want to be sure. factual. And in situations like this, where we're obviously communicating back and forth, we're relying upon memory. We're not fact checking ourselves. Yeah. Something can be said. And, and I hope that people will give us some grace on that. I yeah. mean, please give us some grace. Uh, and also don't sound bite us to death. There are people that will take, I mean, there are parts of this particular interview that if you sound bite it, you could make us sound like a racist right. or like a, a phobic or, or of some sort, but right. sound bites do not solve anything either. You've got to get the greater context of what the conversation of course. was about. Of course. I, I yeah, I, I mean, as a, having attended one of these higher uh, institutions, I, you know, when I was in law school, uh, I, I went to, I went to Harvard law school and I, you know, going there, I figured, I mean, I, I already knew what the educational spectrum looked like. It was right. inherently very liberal. Um, but going there, I, I thought that that environment would welcome lively debate of ideas, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, a, a, a very useful substantive engagement of opposing viewpoints. And it was nothing like that. No. <laughs> I mean, I, I took, a, I, I counted it, the, 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 the classes at Harvard are, are 550 students each, right? It's about 1500 mm. students total in the school. Your first year, they divide you up into seven sections of 80 students. So, um, DeSantis and I were in one section. We had a few other friends and I, I, you get to get to know everybody pretty well. And I took, we, we counted how many just right of center students there were in that 80 
I, I totaled it at nine. Hmm. There were nine of us who were either conservative or right of center or just moderately conservative. Yeah. And that was astounding to me. And the professors are all over one, just uniformly liberal. Um, but they're the, the, uh, the discourse. It's a wonder you got accepted. <laughs> I, I managed to slip in undetected. Yeah. Um, but the, 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 what, the what, where was your undergrad schooling? University of Miami. Yeah. That might've helped. That was a little bit different. Um, yeah. yeah I, I mean, these law schools, they, they're not supposed to have quotas, but if you, if you, if yeah. you go to a, le if you go to a uh, smaller school and you tend to at the school that they only take one or two students from, if you stand out, you can probably get in. Whereas if you go to UT Austin, they take like 10 to 15 students from there every year. You have to be in that 10 to 15, but there's a lot of students there. So yeah, it, it, it's a very diverse uh, admissions process. That's for sure. Uh, but it, the, the, the discourse, the, the dialogue in, in, in these classrooms was just so it was expected that you would have a left of center viewpoint. Mm -hmm. And that was often so frustrating for me, because if you said anything out of the norm, Everyone just kind of looked at you and, and question yeah. your sanity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the, the problem is, is that when you're 22, 23, 25 years old, you're still clueless on a lot of these things. Oh, sure. You're accepting what people have told you and have informed you on, and you're trusting that their information is accurate, right? Which is what undergraduate education is all about. It's, it's, just, it's just giving you, you know, a viewpoint. And then right. you carry that viewpoint to the next level. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, many universities today are, are, are very left of center. So it's surprising that you, we have even conservatives still emerging. Uh, but no. I think part of what's happening is we're getting a backlash uh, now. And I, I think it's probably due to social media. Mm. I think that the, the younger generation is waking up also. Uh, this Gen Z they're not asleep. You know, you think of Z's, a bunch of Z's taking Z's and going to sleep. I don't think this Gen Z is as asleep as we think they are. Yeah. And they're not woke in the uh, left sense of being woke. They are waking up and they're recognizing that this little experiment with blue states versus red states during COVID and with the Biden administration as compared to the Trump administration, um, it's there's a clear winner, you sure. know. If, if you want to if you want to really be progressive in this country, you've got to think more conservatively about mm -hmm. how we operate, yeah. you know, legally, politically, you know, socially. Conservatism has a lot of strengths. And, yeah, I, I have no I make no bones about it. I am a conservative. I am a political conservative. Uh, you know, I, I you know, I grew up that way. I've, I've retained that. I've, I've had challenges to it over the years. But I got to tell you. You know, in my conversations, the more I talk about the true history of our of our nation, the true history, not the history you hear in on, on the History Channel or on right. on NPR or at, on MSNBC, that type of history. None, none of that. The true history of, of our of our nation. Uh, there's a lot to be excited about. And I think we're seeing a generation that's going to rise up and say enough, enough with this. I, I think you um, yeah, you touch on this towards the end of your book, uh, the idea that th th these later generations are much more entrepreneurial yeah, um, exactly. and they're much more inquisitive. And I think those are great attributes. Those are great character traits. Um, and I'm hoping, and I, I think I've seen this with my, I, I have three kids ages 14, 13, and 11. And I've seen this with them. Um, uh, yeah, I just gave you the example of my daughter with the uh, the Florida the Florida law, but she and I had a similar uh, disagreement about masks and the vaccines uh, with COVID uh, a year ago. So I, I, I directed her to look into certain information. I explained to her some things, and then she went, she looked, and she's obviously by, by her nature she is very inquisitive as well. And she ultimately arrived at the same conclusion that I've arrived at concerning the efficacy of masks, the efficacy of the vaccine, so on and so forth. Um, so I, I, I am optimistic, just like you are. I think that this generation is, has the attributes necessary to say enough is enough and hopefully um, take us in a very positive direction. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I think that a lot of there's combined with the distrust that a lot of us in Generation X or uh, yeah. th those generations developed towards government, towards authority i think that the the the, the, the outlook is is bright in my opinion yeah well the pro the pro the distrust that that my generation has and i'm i'm definitely on the upper end of of gen x mm -hmm. 
the uh, the distrust is really because you know my first exposure to politics was the the Nixon administration, and we know how that one ended, right? You know, and then you had the the foibles of the uh, of the Gerald Ford administration, and then we had uh, Jimmy Carter come along in the malaise of the seventies, and it's part of the reason why I'm a conservative is mm -hmm. because I literally graduated from high school in 1981, right when Ronald Reagan took office. The spring of 1981 was when he took the oath of office. Yeah. And I watched the uh, oppositional party. And, and you talk they about getting, to him. Yeah. You talk about getting along with people that you don't yeah. agree with. Um, you know, when you think about Tip O'Neill, who was mm -hmm. the Speaker of the House, him and Ronald Reagan went at it in the public arena. Yeah. But they went out for a beer almost every single night. You know, they, they had a friendship. And when, yeah. when Tip O'Neill died, you know, Ronald Reagan, you know, commented on that relationship, you know, and Tip O'Neill, after he got out of office, he talked about the relationship he had with Ronald Reagan. He said, yes, we were adversaries. Politically, we did not disagree, but he was still a good friend. Yeah. And that's what I want to be. I, I've actually thought about running for a political office, trying to be that type of a politician where we don't have to agree, but I'm going to be your friend. Yeah. You know? Well, one of my, um, one of my best friends from law school was that, I mean, he, at the time he's a raging liberal. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, full blown Barack Obama supporter after, after we got out. And, uh, but we were still and to this day, we remain best friends. It's funny. Yeah. He, he lives in, he lives in LA um, and you know, LA, California, they've been uh, ground zero for some of the harshest COVID lockdown measures and COVID mitigation measures. And I talked to him recently. He says, you know, I'm basically a Republican at this point because this is insanity. Whatever what, what this party is doing is insanity. Yeah. But yeah. that putting that aside, we, you know, yeah, we disagreed vehemently yeah. on some of these issues, some of these political issues and social issues. But at the end of the day, what prevents us, what prevents yeah. people from saying, okay, we can agree to disagree on this. It's not going to affect our personal relationship. Why can't we just move forward and be friends? Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, let me, uh, let me finish with this. Do you think uh, you, you mentioned the founding, you mentioned education, the founding of the country, and then um, how we're, where we're going wrong in the first instance is in the education system. Do you think that the, the role that faith played in the founding of the country is being adequately taught today mm -hmm. in, in schools and in civics and then so on and so forth? No, I, I, I actually, I do not, you know. Um, we, I write for Christian living magazine here in Boise mm -hmm. and I write on, you know, one of the things I do is I try to pick, uh, uh, you know, some of these stories again, that we've not, we've not heard. And what's, what's amazing to me was during COVID, I decided to really study American history in particular, the founding. And I decided that I wasn't going to read, uh, the stuff that's been written in the last 30, 40, 50 years. Mm -hmm. Instead, I chose, you know, you know, Jared Sparks. If you want to understand George Washington, mm -hmm. you don't start with any biography written past 1930. Right. In the 1930s, there was a, there was a couple of biographies that came out that were anti George Washington. They wanted to yeah. spin a whole different negative view of George Washington because up until that point, George Washington was considered a hero. He was very much a, a vaunted uh, yeah. and vaulted hero of our of our culture. Uh, he was untouchable. Abraham Lincoln was the same way. Uh, but there's just been this attempt in history to humanize these guys and to show their faults and all that. Right. But if you want to understand George Washington, you go to uh, the, Jared Sparks, who wrote volumes. I want to think it's like 18 volumes. Uh, just uh, compiling the writings and the journals and the speeches and all that of George Washington. And one of the big questions about George Washington, even in his day, at least uh, when Jared Sparks was, and he was compiling in the about 1830, 1840 area, yeah. uh, these, this information was whether or not, uh, it wasn't that um, George Washington didn't have faith. That was never in question. He had faith. How, how strong of a Christian was he really? And, you know, they, they went to the only person who really knew him and Jared Sparks went, went to Nellie Custis, uh, who was his niece who lived with him. Right. And she talks about how he went to church religiously, how he was very much involved. He would get up at early in the morning and he would read his Bible and he would study scripture and, and such. And yeah. so, I mean, there, his faith was very, very strong. You don't hear those stories anymore. And, you know, I, I think it's because we, we don't want to hear them. At least there's an element of yeah. our, of our educational institutions that don't want us to hear those stories. Yeah. I mean, if you learn about, if you want to go and learn about, the um all of the delegates that were in that room at the constitutional mm -hmm. convention 
they were all men of God. They yeah. were all raised um, going to church, praying in school. At the time, the curricula in schools and yeah. universities had, had a, there was a faith based curriculum. They if you all, went to Harvard. If yeah. you went to Harvard at that time, it was a it was a Christian university. Yep. For the purpose yeah. of not just spinning out lawyers, but preachers. It was a right. pastoral training center. Yeah. What a contrast to today. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah. try to make these places, these secular like oases. Yeah. Um, well, even, even the two greatest, I, I, I don't have time to talk about Thomas Jefferson, but let me just go with Ben Franklin. Sure. Ben Franklin is often labeled. He's a deist, uh, agnostic. Mm -hmm. uh, some, some will even say he's an atheist and such. Well, that just shows you how little you know about religion. Yeah. Lumping all those together. Ben Franklin wrote in a journal when he was 15 years old, I'm a deist. Okay. That's the only statement you have towards his deism because the rest of his life, including, uh, you know, all of his little journals, all of his writings, everything else point to the fact that he later was very religious. He supported religion. He actually built buildings for evangelists in Philadelphia. He went to church, Christ Church there in Philadelphia, has a pew, a family pew at Christ Church. He's buried in the Christ Church Cemetery right next to the church. The guy was religious. Absolutely. You know? I mean, he... Um... We don't hear those stories about Ben Franklin. Oh, he's an agnostic. He's an atheist. I'm going, you don't know Ben Franklin. You've only heard the recent writings about Ben Franklin. You have not, you've not actually read his story and his autobiography. You've only heard one word, one phrase from one time when he uttered when he was 15 years old. Well, he, Ben Franklin was, um, at one point during, during the constitution, constitutional convention, I pulled this up cause I wrote about it recently. Mm -hmm. He was instrumental in bridging a divide that yeah. developed yeah. Uh, during among the delegates. And he, he gave this speech and he was quoted as saying, I have lived, sir, a long time. I'm reading from the article I wrote. Yeah. And the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of the truth that God governs in the affairs of men. And so it, it, I think it certainly demonstrates that his outlook yeah. and many of the delegates' but outlooks at the time no, flowed from this belief that, that in God. And, and that's where they got this idea of natural rights and, 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 and all that. And I, I think that we – I agree with you. We're not – emphasizing the role yeah. that faith played in the views that these delegates have, the principles that they rely on, relied on in crafting our, our, our foundational documents. Yeah. And I think it's, 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 uh, it's a perilous way to go. Yeah. Well, Robert, that, that phrase that you mentioned, that yeah. statement by Ben Franklin, mm -hmm. it's even deeper than that. The constitutional uh, convention at that point was in complete disarray yeah there there were states that were absolutely that were talking about not even let's we're not even going to go further with this yeah there was the, the the entire um idea of the united states of america was coming apart the seams and ben franklin makes that statement but he goes further than that he actually challenges them at that point guys we need to get on our knees and there's a famous painting mm -hmm. i actually have it on my facebook page as my header mm -hmm. of the entire constitutional delegates getting down on their knees and spending time in prayer but they didn't spend prayer have prayer for just a, you know 30 seconds or a minute they prayed all afternoon and then they went to church they went and had a worship service and they came back and they, they had more study. They actually brought in pastors who came in and gave Bible studies on, on understanding, you know, the law and, and how that works within God's law and such. And in the process, they came to a point of repentance on both sides and yeah. the divide that was there melted. And that's why Benjamin Rush, I believe it was Benjamin Rush said that he believed beyond the old and new Testament, there is nothing more divinely inspired than our U S constitution. Yeah. He says, this should never have happened. It's only by divine inspiration that it ever happened at all. Now, mm -hmm. Benjamin Rush was a very strong Christian man, you know, but yeah. you know, we don't hear these stories no. because they're just not, um, they're, they're, they're just not communicated. It goes no, against the narrative that they're all deists and atheists and agnostics. Right. That's just not true. Yeah. Imagine, imagine the scene, imagine what would happen today if, if, in the Senate chamber, after one of these confirmation hearings involving Judge Jackson, they all knelt and prayed for a couple of hours. Yeah. I think uh, the MSNBC well, they just prayed for a couple hours, whether or not it's a good choice. <laughs> right. For that, let's 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 pray whether or not Katanji Jackson's a good choice. 
Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the MSNBC hosts would uh, double over in their chairs. Sure they would. Sure they would. <laughs> That's why we need her on the court is so that so that we can further separate state from from religion. And right. that was not the purpose of of the of the whole phrase anyway. The no, that's true. From state. No, that 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 is true. That's yeah. accurate. Fascinating conversation with you, Robert. I love it. My you know? no, thank you for for your time and for coming on. I uh, you're, you're you're very knowledgeable. I think this uh, the the idea and the thesis behind your book is is very interesting. I think it's worth delving into. And I think it certainly uh, helps us understand the the different generations that are interacting and overlapping right now and, and where where the um, where we're heading in terms of the future. Where, where could uh, people go online to find this book? And uh, do you have a website you can point anyone to? Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, first of all, www.rickchromie.com, just rickchromie.com. That's the place to go. Uh, and, uh, you can, you can, uh, purchase the book through me. I, I do an autograph. So if you want to get personally autographed, that's the way to go, uh, charge about the same as Amazon. But, uh, if you want to go through Amazon, you can go through there or any other place where you buy your books. It's, it's out there in a number of different venues. Uh, would appreciate that. And, uh, yeah. Also, I think if you write, if you, if you go through me, I also will give you a digital copy in addition to the uh, printed copy too. So if you awesome. ask for it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you, Rick. Um, I'd love to have you on again in the future. I think there's yeah. a lot of different things we could uh, delve into a little bit more deeply, especially uh, the, the founders. You mentioned Thomas Jefferson. I think that he's another fascinating character, but there's definitely a lot of things we could talk about. I'd love to have you on. on Let's, in the future. Do so inclined. Let's do it. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. And um, until next time.